Revelation chapter 19 this morning. We have come to what I consider the climactic event of the book of Revelation. It is called the revelation of Jesus Christ in chapter 1 verse 1 for a reason. And this is the revelation of Jesus Christ in verses 11 through 21 of chapter 19. Follow along as I read, and Josh preached this passage last week, and so I think it's a good context to go back to, to just catch us up where we are. So let's just read through from the very beginning of this chapter. I'll read, you follow along. After this, I heard what sounded like the roar of a great multitude in heaven shouting, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God. For true and just are his judgments. He has condemned the great prostitute who corrupted the earth by her adulteries, and he's avenged on her the blood of his servants. And again they shouted, Hallelujah! The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. The 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God, who was seated on the throne, and they cried, Amen! Hallelujah! Then a voice came from the throne saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him both great and small. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters and like loud peals of thunder shouting, Hallelujah for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory for the wedding of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. Then the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to this wedding supper, this banquet of the Lamb. And he added, these are the true words of God. At this I fell at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, don't do that. I am a fellow servant with you and with your brothers and sisters who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for it is the spirit of prophecy who bears testimony to Jesus. And I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True, and with justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns, and he has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh he has this name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun who cried in a loud voice to all the birds flying in midair, Come, gather together for the great supper, the great banquet of God. So that you may eat the flesh of kings, generals, and the mighty, of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, great and small. Then I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to wage war against the rider on the horse and his army. But the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet who had performed the signs on its behalf. With these signs he had deluded those who had received the mark of the beast and worshipped its image. And the two of them were thrown alive into the lake of burning sulfur, and the rest were killed with the sword coming out of the mouth of the rider on the horse, and all the birds gorged themselves on their flesh. Lord, as we come to this passage this morning, may may our hearts be ready to receive what your word says, and may it challenge and speak to those who are on the side of Jesus Christ and those who stand opposed to him. May it speak to both of us this morning. And Lord, may we know how we are supposed to respond to the revelation of Jesus Christ at his return. We pray this in his name. Amen. We've entitled this sermon this morning, The Return of the King. When I said that to the guys in the back, they were saying, well, you, you have to have some sort of illustration out of you know, Lord of the Rings, right? I mean, this is the climactic event of that trilogy. And I mean, if you haven't already seen the preview on Amazon about the the rings of power that's coming with 50 more hours of Lord of the Rings for us, I was like just rejoicing at that. My my daughters were like stunned. What are you talking about, Dad? No desire whatsoever to watch that, but I I, I might force them to watch it, right, at some point. But this is the event, and it's not an event that 
happens because some human will throw a ring into some great fire and end evil. That's not this. That doesn't usher in the return of the king. The return of the king comes because of Jesus Christ. It, becomes, it comes because of the word of God. This is the return of Jesus Christ depicted here. And the return of Jesus Christ, uh, as we think about that event, I think, I think we have different perceptions of that. I've, I was reminded yesterday as I spent some time with some of the families in our church of, of the fact that I've actually referenced this before, and, and they were mocking me for referencing it. But when I was a, a younger person, I looked to the return of Christ as something that I didn't want to come until I experienced more of life. Like, I wanted to experience marriage. I wanted to experience all of that sort of stuff. Please, Lord, don't let that happen until that, you know, those events unfold. That's what I thought of it as a kid. I want to live life first. Before Christ comes. Others view the return of Christ as no big deal. We've experienced tragedy before and disaster before and we'll survive it again. They treat it almost like in the song that came to my mind was the REM song from the 1980s, right? It's the end of the world as we know it and I feel fine. No big deal. We'll just go through this event as well. But that's not how Revelation depicts this. This is the end of the world as we know it. And there won't be survivor. That's the depiction here. So what do we do with this text? Let's look how it unfolds for us this morning and what John is doing and God is doing through this text We've come to this point in Revelation on a couple of different occasions. It is the climactic event of this book. It's been referenced back in chapter 6 at the end of the seal cycle with the earthquake and the hail and the storms and the islands fleeing from the presence of God and the earth and the generals and the people of the earth and the kings and everyone else crying out, who can stand in that day? But then there was delay and pause and another cycle of judgments established as it came right up to this precipice again in chapter 11 and again the he heaven announcing and proclaiming this is the great day of God his victory is coming and praise and worship of him and glory to him for this and earthquakes and hail and all of this at the end of the trumpet cycle but then we ushered in the bowl judgments Coming right up to this point, well, now we are going to enter this point and see the return of Christ here in chapter 19. This event has been anticipated throughout not just Revelation, but Scripture. You can go back to numerous Old Testament prophets that look to the great day of the Lord when he will come and conquer and destroy and set things right. It is a great day of salvation as well as a great day of judgment. And what you have here is really this, this crisscrossing pattern in Scripture and also the book of Revelation. It's very much like a movie where you get to that climactic point where the, the enemy who's seemed so successful throughout the movie and the, the protagonist who's struggled along where there's that grace, great reversal where there, there's this crisscross pattern where the, the enemy falls but the, the one who is the hero extends through and wins. And that's what we see in the book of Revelation. The beast, Satan and the dragon have waged war and they've looked very victorious, but now they are on the downward trend and the fall and this is their ultimate demise. And yet those whom they've persecuted and put to death and, and tortured for their witness of Jesus Christ have started out looking like things are very bleak for them, but now all of a sudden Christ returns and they are vindicated. That's what this event does. And the depiction of this from the ancient world is very much like a, a Roman victory march. It's a parade more than it's a battle. It's, it's the king coming and riding on this white horse, this victorious animal, parading through the city as his people are there to praise and glorify him as he drags his enemies behind. The victory is already won even before the battle has begun, is how Revelation depicts it. 
And so as this story unfolds, I want us to see three emphases that John makes in this depiction of the second coming of Christ. Heaven opens, and we are anticipating a fresh revelation from God, but it's, it's not just a, a verbal word. It is the word of God who emerges in this scene, the Son in his full glory, his victorious return. And so the first part to this vision is Christ's glorious appearance. In verses 11 to 16, detail that this is the return of Christ in full glory. Something that the disciples said we beheld, right? His glory, he was full of grace and truth when he was on earth. But it was a, it was a, a veiled glory. It was a, a glory in incarnation, in human form. But now Christ is fully glorified, returning in his fullness. And the description of verses 11 through 16 speak to that. We've seen many of these descriptors earlier in Revelation. These are the same attributes that Christ had in chapters 1, 2, and 3 as he critiqued and he reviewed each of the churches. But now they are in full form coming as he is about to judge the world. He is described in verse 11 as the writer who is called faithful and true. He is faithful to his promises and he is true in his words. You see, these are a blessing for those of us who've placed our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. We look to this day where God fulfills his word in Christ, proves himself faithful to these promises, that he will keep his word. Human life as we have come to know it will end at this great day with the promised return of Jesus Christ. He said he would come again and now he does. So these are a great blessing to us who have placed our faith in Christ. Why? Because this is our hope, the glorious appearing of Jesus Christ. But it is also a severe warning to those who reject Christ. Because this means judgment. He will return and carry out his judgment on those who oppose him. He is, though, the faithful and true He is secondly here, and we're just going to rip through these descriptors. He is the one who judges and wages war justly. Just war. Something that governments always are wrestling with. When is a war justified to enter into? Now, countries weigh the pros and cons. Our country looks to Ukraine and Russia, and we wonder, is this a just war? Should we engage in this? We might have another one coming on our doorstep soon with China and Taiwan? Do we engage in something like that? Is it a justified war? And ethicists and politicians wrestle with those things because war is death. War is ravaging. War is destructive. But in the book of Revelation, as er evidenced earlier in chapter 12, Satan, and this is the language, waged war in heaven in his opposition of Christ, and he was cast out of heaven down to earth. He then turned his attention on the people of God and began to wage war on them. The beast, with the help of the dragon, brings together the kings of the earth to oppose God, to oppose his people, to oppress them, and wages war against God in chapter 16 at the, the battle of Armageddon, which we are about to see unfold here in 19. So now Christ engages them in this war, and he does this in justice. Fairness for the wicked actions of the world and its followers. You see, when Christ enters into war, his actions are just because of his character and who he is as God. And in light of the wickedness of the world, he does so completely fairly. This is why, and I think Josh hit on this theme last week, this is why vengeance is God's and not ours. He gets to repay because he is perfectly holy and he is perfectly fair in his judgments. But we see Christ then as this agent enacting this. Further, the description goes on with his eyes. His eyes are like blazing fire. He sees perfectly and completely. He sees these penetrating with these penetrating and omniscient eyes a complete view of the world and the judgment that awaits 
the wickedness. There will be no question on the great day of the Lord at his return whether this was fair because Christ knows and sees all completely and knows everything that is in every single one of us. And so when this day happens, it will be completely fair. Fourthly, he is described here as the one who is crowned, right? On his head are many crowns. I've always thought this is a weird depiction. How do you wear multiple crowns on your head? You would have to have multiple heads or something, right? This is not the way we think of crowns. It's, it is this word, and we sang about it, a diadem. A diadem in that day was a band. It was a cloth band that you would, like a, a headband that you would wear around your head. And it was given by an emperor or two other kings to depict what region that they had rule over. Christ, with these many diadems, has all of these bands on his head, depicting that he has sovereignty over all the nations. That's the picture here. These are the bands that represent a particular region, and the fact that Christ has many of these is depicting that he has sovereignty and rule over all of the earth. And unlike the beast, and unlike the dragon who were given crowns for a temporary time, Christ wears these eternally. They are his forever and ever. He possesses sovereignty over all nations. We might not see that now, but when he returns, the world will see who its true ruler is. Fifthly, he earned his victory through self-sacrifice. He is dressed in a robe, dipped in blood. Scholars debate, what is this blood that it's dipped in? It's the word baptized. I mean, the, 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 the robes are placed in and completely immersed in this blood, and that's what he is wearing here. And some argue, well, this is the, the blood of his enemies that he is about to destroy, but he hasn't destroyed them yet, so I don't think that's what it is. This stands in contrast to the fact that the whore... The prostitute of Babylon wore what? Scarlet, red. The dragon was depicted as red. Christ wears the true red, but it's not the blood of others. It's whose blood? His own blood. You see, Christ has earned his victory, his place, his ability to do this through his own self-sacrifice. He is the atoning sacrifice. He laid his life down as the lamb to cover the sins of the world so that people from every tribe, tongue, and nation can place their faith and trust by looking to him and trusting him and therefore be aligned with his side. And he comes dressed in that sacrifice. Further, he is called here the word of truth. This is his name. This name that is written on him that no one knows is now revealed as king of kings and lord of lords, as the word of God. Back in Revelation 1, 2, the word of God represented the purposes and the intentions for God to bring his plan of salvation to his people and to this world. Here's the point. Christ is the plan of God. Christ is the purpose of God. Christ is the intentions of God. This is God's answer to humanity for their sin and their rejection of him. He is God's word. And the culmination of all of the plans of God are fulfilled in him. And he brings salvation and deliverance to the people of God, because he's the word of God. Notice who comes with him. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses, dressed in fine linen, white and clean. He brings his loyal followers with him, and I think this is depicting both angelic as well as human armies. This is all of those who've stayed loyal to the Lamb, all of those who have rejected the dragon, who did not get cast out with him, but all of those who have aligned themselves with the Lamb, both angelic creature and human. This is us. If we are believers in Jesus Christ, this is us at this great day where we are, are called and gathered to Christ and we accompany him if we are alive on earth. But if we have died, we are coming back with him at this point, as we will see in next week's sermon, the great resurrection of the dead that takes place at this time as well. They are following with him. They are heaven's army. But notice, we don't have any swords in this text. We're just riding horses. We'll get to why that is in a little bit. 
But this is the side of Christ. And he brings his followers. And those who are faithful are on his side. And then the text goes on to speak of how he engages this war. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He unleashes the full wrath of God over his opponents. Three actions here in this verse. First, this sharp sword coming out of his mouth to strike the nations. This is what he will use to destroy all those who oppose him. And it's his word. It, there's not, Christ, uh, this is metaphor, okay? The, the whole, I think the whole thing is metaphor. It's the return of Jesus Christ. But what that looked like in this day was this victorious one coming and the the sword coming from his mouth is his word. As he speaks it, this will be what destroys his enemies. Because his word is faithful. His word is true. He is the word of God. And so it's the perfect revelation of God at this time that will destroy all of those who stand as his enemies. And he destroys them, not with deception, as we saw with the beast and the dragon and all of these things. The things that came out of their mouth were things like frogs and deception and and perversion. But here, Christ comes with this sword that is truth that destroys. And he rules, as the text goes on to say, the nations with an iron rod. Referring back to Psalm 2, verse 9, as a shepherd's club. This is the club with which he would beat away enemies and, and predators and other things from the sheep. It's a violent image, but Christ comes with that. And third, he will trample the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God. Those who stood opposed to God throughout Revelation have, as chapter 16 and 17 described, drunk the immorality of Babylon. But now those who have drunk that and followed that and been a part of that now become the wine in God's winepress as Christ spills their blood, because they have spilled the blood of his followers. This is a violent and a vicious scene. As Christ announces his judgment, and lastly, on his robe and on his thigh, most likely on his robe along his thigh is what that's supposed to indicate, is written these words. Why is it written there? Because as a Rider on a horse, what would you see as far as the prominent place on that rider? You would see his thigh sitting up on that horse, and that's where this is written. King of kings and Lord of lords, announcing that he is the only king and Lord. While Caesar and other emperors might put themselves up as the greatest, as king, as Lord, as even divine, there is only one, according to the Revelation, who is this. Jesus Christ is the only one can name that, make that claim. He is truly divine. So what do we make of this glorious appearance of Christ? How do we respond to this? And the, the response that came to my mind as I was studying and thinking and praying through this was this, that Christ's glorious appearance needs to ob- motivate within me now obedience. This day is coming, and it will arrive like that, according to this passage. Therefore, we cannot be those who procrastinate. I don't know about you, but I I struggle with procrastination. Why? Because I always work best when the deadline is right there. That's that's my excuse, right? Like, it's that's my best work comes right before the deadline. And in many ways, we can pull that off as humans. We can we can pull it off at the very end, and we can become confident in our ability to do that. Plus, procrastination typically is something that we like, we, we want to enjoy the fun stuff now, and we want to put the work off as long as we can. I mean, how many of you as a kid, when your parents said, I want you to do this before I return home, immediately went and did the work? Now, maybe you were one of those nerdy kids who did that, but all of us did what? We went and played and played and played, and then if we remembered, we got to the work right before mom or dad got home. We loved it when they told us, I'll be home at 5 o'clock or something like that, right? So at 4.45, we could get the work done. The problem with Christ's return is there is no timing to this. We don't know the date or the hour when Christ will return. 
Therefore, we cannot be those who procrastinate, thinking that we can scramble at the very end to finish the job. No. The call throughout Revelation to the nations has been one of repentance. Repent now. Choose now to follow the Lamb. Those who are on the Lamb's side, choose now to witness and to testify of Jesus Christ. This is our mission. And therefore, we are to obey the summons, not right before Christ returns, but now. Be ready now. Be on watch now for the return of Jesus Christ. You see, God has saved you and I and left us in this world with a mission. Go and make disciples of all the nations. Baptizing, yes. Converting them, yes. But teaching them. Whatever I commanded you, we are to be involved in this process of of witness and of discipleship of others, maturing them so that they can go do the same here in this community, within our families, and around the world. That's our mission. Jesus left us here to do this, and he didn't leave us here to procrastinate in that mission. He wants us to heed his warning now because we don't know when he will return And the most humiliating thing for us at his return would be for us not to be what? Ready. Not to be engaged in the activity to which he has called us. This glorious appearance needs to motivate action in us now. If you're an unbeliever, it's calling you to place your faith and trust in Christ now. Not later, not let me have fun first and then let me come to Christ later. That's not the emphasis here. You do not know this day. That is... Russian roulette with eternity. And for believers, it is a call to engage the discipleship process now. And this only intensifies as the scene continues. The second emphasis of John here is not only the the glorious appearance of Christ, but it's the angelic invitation for these birds to feast on the opposition. There's this call to this great supper of God. And this is a fascinating aspect of Revelation 19 because there's actually two suppers that are depicted in Revelation 19. There is the great marriage supper of the Lamb. And then there is the great supper, banquet of God depicted here. In my mind, when I always thought of the marriage supper of the Lamb that we ate at, I always, it always conjured up visions of, of the first Harry Potter movie where they're sitting down at that table and this huge table and all of a sudden all of this glorious food appears. And you're there eating whatever you want, and it's beautiful, and it's going to be great, and it's going to be this huge banquet, right? Well, the marriage supper of the Lamb, when it actually comes to fruition, is birds eating the dead, destroyed enemies of God. That's the great marriage supper of the Lamb. And it's a gruesome picture. But why, why the, these two things? Well, it's again this that, that got the dichotomy in this text of, of blessing and rejoicing and celebration on the part of God's people, but utter ruin and destruction and humiliation and tragedy for those who reject Christ. The carrion birds, the birds of prey, are invited to feast on the enemies of God. As Grant Osborne says in his commentary, the saints partake of the great banquet and the sinners will be the great banquet. One of the questions that emerges from this text is who are these people? Is this everyone else? Or is it just these who have come to wage war? And I can't help but think throughout Revelation that this is the climactic event. And I I know some want to not think of this as everyone present that gets destroyed here. It's only the armies that have gathered, and I know certain eschatological systems can make that work, but I really think the emphasis in Revelation is that all of those who have received the mark of the beast is every other person on earth. That's Revelation 13. And they are gathered here, and the language to speak of all people, great and small, rich and poor, is leaving none out of the picture. All of those who are not with the Lamb, who are not resurrected to life, who are not accompanying Him, will be destroyed. 
because they have taken the mark of the beast. They have rejected the lamb, and they worship the beast rather than the lamb. They give themselves to the world system, and therefore they are destroyed at this great day. What's the point to this invitation? Heed the invitation to trust Christ alone now. To me, this is the great application for unbelievers in this text. This is not a pretty picture for for those who are not on the side of Christ. They are a defeated enemy that stand no chance at his return. Being eaten by animals after death would be a completely humiliating picture. There's only a few people in scripture that had that happen to them. Jezebel was one, right? That, that's kind of the, the, the emphasis here. You don't want to be Jezebel. You don't want to be the enemy of God and eaten on his great day. No one will escape the day of the Lord. And so this invitation goes out. Invitations are an interesting thing. There's going to be a wedding that takes place here of the bride and Christ, and there's an invitation that's going out. And whenever a wedding invitation goes out, you hear the announcement, and you, you wonder, am I going to get invited to this event, or am I not going to get invited to this event, right? This wedding, all are invited. You get a wedding invitation, or you reject to come. This banquet is open to all. But at Christ's return, you either are a part of the wedding banquet of Christ, or you, again, are the wedding banquet of Christ. There's no jumping sides at the event. It's over. Your status in life your position in life, your achievement in life, none of that will matter because both great and small are included in this. Heed the invitation to trust Christ alone now. And the last emphasis in this chapter is found in verses 19 to 21, and that is Christ's victory over those who oppose him. Then I saw the beast The kings, this goes back to Revelation 16, they're gathered here to wage war against the lamb, to wage war against the ruler or the rider on the horse and his army. As I think of this battle and this scene and and the utter defeat that it will usher in, I was reminded of a commercial, it's a recent commercial of depicting these grade school children sitting out on a basketball court and they're choosing sides and standing on the court is Charles Barkley and they're picking sides as to who they want on their team and the girl says, I want, I want Charles Barkley. And you know, Barkley celebrates with, yes, I knew she'd pick me first as he trash talks the little kid that's standing next to him. And it's such a ridiculous picture because it's such an obvious choice with that kind of superstar on your team. He's going to dominate third graders. That's just going to happen But this isn't even going to be a game because it's obvious who will win at this war. And this is a more obvious outcome than Charles Barkley. These forces gathered back in 16 verses 13 to 16 at Armageddon to stand opposed to God. Here is the actual battle taking place and it's an instantaneous defeat of the enemies. There, there isn't even a war. It's over immediately. The, the beast is captured. The false prophet with him. They're immediately hurled into the lake of fire. And everyone else is made food for the birds. This is showing the power of Jesus Christ in battle. And although the world might think that the beast and this system are unbeatable, remember they cried out in chapter 13, verse 4, who is like the beast and who can wage war against him as they worship him? Who is like the beast? Here Christ comes and immediately destroys him. This is utter humiliation for the unbeliever. 
for those who reject to follow Christ. So what do we do in this battle? We're the ones coming with. We just kind of come with. I think sometimes we think, I'm going to have a sword and I'm going to be wiping out enemies. No, that's not your role. You're just coming with Christ. You're on his side. He does all of it instantaneously. That's how powerful he is. It's not our place to enact God's justice. He does it. God meets out judgment through his faithful and true warrior, Jesus Christ. Our battle is the battle now, believer. We engage, how? Through our witness, through our testimony, through our faith in the blood of the Lamb and the call to bring others to faith in Jesus Christ. That's how we engage the war. We lay our life down like Christ did, and at this great day, he vindicates that. So what is our application from this last point? Long for this victorious day by preparing yourself and others now. While we may be presently involved in difficult circumstances, and you might be sitting here today going, Phil, you don't know what I'm going through or what I'm experiencing. You're right. The difficulties of life are harsh from a human perspective. It doesn't look very victorious for us right now. But we are guaranteed by these verses that God will prevail. We are called to persevere during this life, looking for this as our great hope. This coming will happen. Our eyes are to be focused on this event. This event should be something that we think about every single day of our life. Because this is our eternity. This is our great hope as followers of Christ. And while some might believe that it's not fair that God should act this way toward unbelievers, such an opinion does not have a proper understanding of who God is. You see, our God is a God of love, and at the same time, He's a God of justice. He is a God of, of mercy, and He's a God of holiness, and He's a God of grace and truth. And yet He will, in fairness, set things right. You see, the consequences of sin and the rejection of God come to a head and ultimately God judges them on this great day. And he must adequately deal with sin by eliminating it in order to usher in his new creation in righteousness. So what do we do with the return of the king? I think... The main idea of Revelation 19 is this, that the return of the king must change our mindset and our actions now. That commercial with Charles Barkley is a Capital One credit card commercial. And it's extolling the benefits of choosing Capital One. It's a no-brainer to go with our credit card. It's an easier decision than this decision of picking Charles Barkley. Revelation 19, though, shows us that the eternal, easiest decision of all is simple. Choose Jesus Christ. Because this day of Revelation 19 will happen because Christ is faithful and true and he will return because God keeps his promises. And so why would you not choose Christ And why would you not do that now? This is the easiest decision of all. Give your life to him. For those of us who are believers, I ask, how often do you think about the return of Jesus Christ? How often does that come into your mind? If this is the climactic event of human history, of the plan of God, this is the finish line right here. Why should that not be something that we are constantly running through our mind over and over and over again? This is what will enable us to endure. This is what will enable us to stand up under trial. This should motivate our actions now. This should cause us to fall on our knees in prayer every day to open this word, to see what God has to say so that this can transform my life, so that I can be purposeful in my mission that God has called me to, that Christ has placed me in.
And I ask this question as well. If you knew that this event would take place this evening, this event, this, this is going to happen tonight, what would you do with your afternoon? I mean, I think a lot of us would be on the phone calling as many unsaved relatives and friends that we knew and begging them to look at this passage and think through the ramifications of what it's saying and begging them to accept Christ. I mean, maybe we would still gather this evening and, and enter into a worship night for our, our, not for our young people, but usher in Christ. I mean, that would be pretty cool to be gathered with the corporate body to be celebrating and looking for that. But I think most of us would be on mission because we would want to get that last word out. But why procrastinate to the end? Do it now. Because this could happen this evening. This could happen at any point where time is over and time is up and eternity begins. Is the return of king changing your mindset? I'm going to close with a quote. It's an extensive quote that's been attributed to C.S. Lewis, but I think it hits hard. And so I'm going to read this quote, and then we're going to close in a word of prayer and have one final song. But follow along as I read this. Speaking of the second coming, God will invade. But I wonder whether people who ask God to interfere openly and directly in our world quite realize what it will be like when he does. When that happens, it is the end of the world. And when the author walks onto the stage, the play is over. God is going to obey, invade all right, but what is the good of saying you are on his side then when you see the whole natural universe melting away like a dream and something else, something it never entered your head to conceive, comes crashing in? Something so beautiful to some of us and so terrible to others that none of us will have any choice left. For this time, it for this time, it will, be, uh, it will be God without disguise. Something so overwhelming that it will strike either irresistible love or irresistible horror into every creature. It will be too late then to choose your side. There is no use saying you choose to lie down when it becomes impossible to stand. That will not be the time for choosing. It will be the time when we discover which side we really have chosen, whether we realized it before or not. Now, today, this moment is our chance to choose the right side. And God is holding back to give us that chance, and it will not last forever. We must take it or leave it now. Which side are you on? And are you making that decision now through your actions and mindset? Lord, as we come to you this morning, what a glorious thing the return of Christ is. But as Revelation 19 shows us, what a horrifying thing the return of Christ is. Because as this quote from C.S. Lewis says, there won't be choice at that moment. It's over. And this world will melt away and the new heavens and new earth will come crashing in. And we long for that day. We want that day. That is our hope. But Lord, as I think upon us as a church today, is it really our hope? Is it my hope? Is that what dominates my thinking? Because that is our future, Lord. You promised us this. And we're going to see it over these next weeks that... This is a glorious, glorious thing. But God, I, I repent, and I think many of us here today repent, need to repent that our eyes are so fixated on the here and the now, the things of this world, the things of our anticipated future where we'll be successful and our kids will have grandkids and we'll celebrate with them and we'll we look forward to preparing as we save up our monies for here and now and and provide for our own future and don't realize lord that we are on mission that we trust you for our daily bread and we are to use the resources and the means and the power and every moment you give us to witness and testify that jesus christ is the lamb and he is returning and it will change everything. 
God, use these verses this morning to just penetrate into the hearts of those who are gathered here. To give us an overwhelming sense of this great day of the Lord, the return of the King. It will come. And Lord, may we not be those who are taken surprised by it, but may we be those who've placed our faith and trust in Christ, who are looking for this and are looking by following Jesus Christ, by heeding his commission on our life to go to the nations, to take the word of God, the plan, the gospel of God, of salvation in Jesus Christ, to this community in our actions, in our words, in our deeds, as we go into our workplaces, as we live among our neighbors, as we speak and communicate among our family and friends, may the, 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 the hope of Jesus Christ be something that is seen in us each and every day. And may it motivate, change, and transform our, our minds and our actions as a corporate body and as individuals. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. This is our hope. This is our plea. This is our salvation. May we be those who aren't ashamed of it, but may we be those who are faithful on that day, looking forward to your return. And Lord, may you be glorified through us, I pray, in Jesus' name.